Good morning. Welcome to Valencia Presbyterian Church and for worshiping with us this morning. Today we have our Elder Matt McKinley preaching and delivering God's word, so um, we're excited about that. Um, I just have one announcement this morning. Um, on behalf of uh, session, in an effort to keep everybody informed of where we're at in the process of discerning God's call in the future for Valencia Presbyterian Church, um, we have hired um, on a uh, transitional and, and temporary basis, um, Mr. Tom McMeekin is our tra uh, transitional pastor, um, and Reverend Jim Steiner is our um, transitional coach. So when you came in where the bulletins are, um, there's this handout, and this is kind of the first step in this process. Um, we are going to need to form a transitional team. Um, and the, the pamphlet really spells out what this team is and its purpose and its objectives, but just a couple highlight is to reflect on our history, um, discover a new identity, um, empowering and allowing leadership changes, um, renewing denominational linkages, and also committing to a new direction in ministry. So what we are asking is, number one, for prayers for this upcoming team and for session, um, just that God's call and God's way is made clear to, uh, to the leadership. Um, but Tom and Jim are going to um, help us with this process in getting this started and then be with us during the, uh, the entire process. And they have said that they will be available after church today and then again on, uh, on August 6th that if you would like to ask questions or you know, talk to them individually that they'll, they'll be available for those discussions. So feel free to see them after church on those days. So this transitional team is going to be elected by session, and again, it's kind of the first step in this process of um, discerning God's call for our future. So what I would suggest is everybody take one of these. Um, it was also sent out an email. Read over it. Um, if you're interested in being part of this team, it's about five to eight members, depending upon um, how many people volunteer or, or are elected by session. Um, and if you are interested, on the back side of the, the paper um, is information about who to talk to about that. So either um, uh, Tom or Jim or any member of session. Um, and our goal is that our next session meeting on August, I don't remember the date of it, in August, um, we are going to bring these names and begin the process of putting this team together. So that gives us about three to four weeks to start putting that information together and, um, and beginning this process. Um, the other thing that I wanted to mention this morning is um, we are going to have a congregational meeting on August 6th. Um, and that is for the purpose, and it'll be right after church like we normally do them. Um, that'll be the, for the purpose of the uh, dissolution of um, Pastor Jim's call to ministry um, because of his retirement. So if you could um, try and be in attendance for that, it would probably take us very long, just a few minutes, to conduct some official business of the church. So um, again, consider joining the team. Um, and if you uh, could also offer our prayers for the uh, leadership here at the church. Um, let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Please join me responsively in our call to worship. We look at this world focusing on the pain and confusion, the fears and hatred which seem to abound. 
We wait breathlessly for the goodness of creation to be made manifest in all of the world, for this is the promise of God. Get ready, dear friends. The promises of God are true. Please join me in singing our opening hymn as we stand together, if able, called as partners in Christ's service. Please be seated. Jesus said, peace I leave with you, a peace that the world cannot give. Christ be, with, be always with you. Let us offer one another a sign of peace. Our call to confession this morning. God's great ha grace has brought us from death to life, transforming us into instruments of righteousness. Trusting that grace, let us confess our sin and the sins of the world using our unison prayer of confession. God of providence, your faithfulness is from everlasting to everlasting, but we fail to trust. You hold all creation in the palm of your hand, but we take our lives into our own hands more often than we would like to admit. When we trust ourselves more than your grace, forgive us. When we get caught up in our own strivings, relieve us. When we think the world rests on our shoulders, remind us. Call us back to your way. Teach us to turn our lives over to your gracious care. Amen. And our assurance of forgiveness. As a cup of cold water quenches our thirst, God's grace soothes our soul. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Hallelujah. Please stand to sing. Friends, would you pray with me, please? As a cup of cold water, nope, sorry. Pour out your spirit upon us, O God, and upon these words of scripture, that they may reveal to us your eternal word, our Lord in Jesus Christ. Amen. 
So our first New Testament reading today comes from John 1, and it's verses 35 through 40. The next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When the two disciples heard him saying this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, What do you want? They said, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Come, he replied, and you will see. So they went and saw where he was staying, and they spent that day with him. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John had said and who, and who had followed Jesus. Good morning. Our second New Testament reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. And this hopefully is familiar to you. I've used it before, and we used it uh, in our Wednesday evening messages as well. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Now please stand with me as we sing the sermon hymn, Lord, Speak to Me. be seated. And at this time, Mary's going to come forward with the children's room. I can turn it oh, oh, I do have to turn it on. I apologize. <laughs> All right. There we go. I told AJ he didn't have to come up because he'd probably fall asleep. We had a very long night last night. So two New Testament readings and no Old Testament reading. I found that weird because most of the time we have an Old Testament reading as well. And I was like, Lord, why are we doing two New Testament readings? That's different for us. And I didn't even realize it until this morning. Every time we get up here and we learn something new about the Bible, it, it hits you in a different way. And for me, it was the 4 o'clock that took, took hold. What time was it that you realized God wanted you with him? What time was it? It was so important that they wrote it down in the Bible a book that gets printed for tons of people that at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, that's when they met Jesus. But for all of us, it happens at different times. It could happen when you get up in the middle of the night and realize you were there for a friend. When exactly did you see Jesus in your life? Who were you with? What friends were you with? Now go back to those New Testament lessons that we had. We have Matthew and we have John. We have the beginning of John. Before Jesus even produced his first miracle, what time did you meet him? It was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. So it was a sunny day, and you were skipping along. For me, I still remember it was my grandma's house next door, running over to get cookies because my mom was a monster to me, as mothers can be. So I ran next door to grandma to feel better. She helped me understand the Lord, and I remember it was a morning they were still dew on the grass. Now, that's not written in the Bible, my story, but your story is always written. What time was it? What time was it that you met? Now, go over to John. We're at the end of John, right? Did I get those confused? 28. 
end of Matthew. Matthew, okay, I apologize. Get him a little confused. The end of Matthew. Jesus already told all this story. We already learned all the things that he did, but he called out and he wants you to step up. He says all power and authority is given unto him and we are supposed to be those disciples. It's our job to come together as friends. These two children right here that I brought with me, poor AJ, totally exhausted, out super late with his mom, but still here with me to rest his head on my shoulder and bringing a friend. There were two the day that Jesus met them. There's two right here. Where two come together, all power and authority in prayer, remembering that when we call on to God, he gives us that power to follow him and to make disciples of those all around us. We're so blessed in that. Thank you very much. I'm going to close in a prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, sometimes we don't know exactly what we're supposed to get out of a message. But the biggest thing is, what time do we know you? 24-7, all the time, you are there for us. Please bless us throughout our day and all the many transitions that we go through. Thank you so much, Lord, for the family that we have all become because time goes on forever, just like your love. In Jesus' name, we all say? Amen. Thank you, Mary. Uh, it amazes me. You're, you're given a couple Bible verses and you transform it into your message each time, so we appreciate that. So a couple notes before I get started with the sermon. First of all, I want you to know I'm going without a safety net today. I have no PowerPoint. I don't remember the last time I presented without a PowerPoint. So, so be with, please be with me. Be patient. Second of all, right before the, the sermon and the, the, uh, before the, the service started, Mr. Steiner said to me, Lazarus, the Red Sea, and your message. And then they, we prayed together, and it caught me during the prayer. He had pointed out two miracles. I guess he's looking for a third miracle here this morning with my message. So we'll, we'll see. My prayer is that hopefully my words are his words and, and touch you. So as you looked at the title of today's sermon, some of you may have thought, oh boy, here he goes again. You may be tired of hearing me speak about core discipleship, and probably with good reason. So much of what I have read and heard has related back to core discipleship and, as you can probably tell, has greatly affected me spiritually. It has affected my thinking, but probably more importantly is it affected my actions. I'm definitely trying to put more of what I read of God's word into action. I don't always feel like I'm being successful, but I do feel like I'm making a greater effort in this area. This is why I've been so focused on core discipleship and this is why I'm excited to continue to share it with you. In the past, I've shared the following about core discipleship with you. The Great Commission, which we just read and Mary talked about, and that's our charge to make disciples of all nations. And we're going to be hitting that later in this message. Talked about Jesus' model of core discipleship, where he preached to crowds, large groups, he preached to what they call cells or smaller groups, and he also had a core group of three to four. We talked about equipping the saints for ministry, and that we're going to hit again today. We talked about growing in Jesus. We talked about what it means to be saved. We, and we talked about what it means to be a child of God, and we also hit spiritual maturity. And today we are going to discuss the four components of the discipleship process. Now these four components began to hit the heart of our faith. And these four components include identified, ident excuse me, identifying what is in your heart, acknowledging Jesus' invitation to us, accepting Jesus' invitation, and accepting the call of a disciple of Jesus. So first off, we're going to hit identifying what is in your heart. 
Aaron read to us John chapter 1, verses 35 through 40. I want to focus specifically on verse 38 there. I'll, I'll read 37, which leads into it. When the two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and asked, what do you want? Now that question can mean a lot of different things. Looking at the reply of the disciples, it doesn't look like they really understood what he was asking them. They quickly asked him a different question. Well, where are you staying? Let's explore what Jesus really meant with this, with the question, what do you want? I think what he really meant was, what is in your heart? Today, everyone is searching for something. We all have this inherent gap in us that needs filled. People choose to fill this gap in many different ways. Some choose worldly things like money, power, fame, other things, even addictions. These things will only take you so far with how you feel. Some may even begin on the path to Jesus, but get caught up in other distractions, sometimes even distractions from the church. Many of us know that that gap can only be filled by Jesus. So what Jesus is asking us to do is identify what it is that is seated in the throne of our lives right now. So what is seated in the throne of your life right now? Is it Jesus? Is it something else? To answer this, you need to take some time to reflect and pray. Once you've answered those questions, you can move on to the second component of the discipleship process, acknowledging Jesus' invitation to us. Before we can acknowledge his invitation, we need to answer the following question, to what does he invite us? To answer that question, I'm going to dive a little more into scripture. And now this is the audience participation time. If you have a piece of paper, a pen, something to jot down, please do so. I'm going to read the verse or verses, and I want you to help me identify what it is that Jesus is inviting us to. The first part of scripture that we're going to hit is Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 30. Come to me, all who are weary and heaven laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus has invited all who are weary to come to him for rest. The next passage, John chapter 7, verses 37 and 38. Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood out saying, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. Jesus has invited all who are thirsty to come to him for drink, spiritual drink, his living waters. John chapter 6, verses 33 through 35. For the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. Jesus said to him, to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. Jesus has invited all who are hungry to come to him for bread, and remembering he is the bread. Now this last one may be a little tougher, but stay with me. I am going back to the Old Testament. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. Jesus has invited all who need forgiveness to come to him. The last one is forgiveness. 
we must recognize that God always makes the first move. He is the one who invites us to come to him. Isaiah 43, 1 says, But now, that is what the Lord says, He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name, and you are mine. So we acknowledge that Jesus has invited us to accept him into our hearts. All we need to do is accept his invitation. This is the third component of the discipleship process. Accepting Jesus' invitation. What does it mean to accept his invitation? In John chapter 1, verse 12, Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, and this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. So when we accept Jesus' invitation, those two passages point out that we are children of God and we are recipients of eternal life. Jesus wants us to come to him. However, far too often, we want him to come to us our schedules, our plans, our activities. We want him to fit into our lifestyle, our plans. We get caught up in the busyness of life. But following him, accepting his invitation, means changing our lifestyle. A change in our heart occurs. Then we are transformed. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. And when this happens, we should strive to be obedient to God's word. We should strive to be loving. We should strive to be fruitful. So to review, we, we have three components of the process covered at this point. We identify what is in God's heart, or what is in our heart. We identify Jesus' invitation to us. We acknowledge that. And we accept Jesus' invitation. Finally, in the fourth component, we accept the call as a disciple of Jesus. The Great Commission. I told you I'd be back to it. Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So to do what Jesus is asking in this passage, as disciples, we must be equipped to pass on our faith. This is part of what we're trying to accomplish with our midweek meal with a message on Wednesday evenings. And I'll do a shameless plug here. In the fall, we're going to begin tentatively September 6th. That still needs to be approved by Discipleship Committee. But we're looking to begin on uh, Wednesday evening, September 6th at 6 p.m. with dinner, 7 p.m. lesson. And what we're doing in those lessons is we are learning and growing together. In Ephesians, Paul writes, Ephesians 4, verses 12 and 13, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, it's sad to know that we'll never reach the level of Christ on this earth right now until he returns. But we are striving to get closer and closer to him. And this is a sacred trust Jesus has given us. Passing on the gospel message without alteration or addition. 
Jesus' disciples needed to grow in faith before this could take place. They needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes as we're reading through the passages, we can be tough on his disciples. But aren't we often just like them? We also may not answer the call the first time like some of them may not have. And why don't we answer the call? Sometimes it's because out of fear. Let me give you an illustration of overcoming your fears. We need to be like the 84-year-old grandmother who fiercely maintained her independence and lived alone in the old family home. Her four children lived in the same town, but she rarely called them except in emergencies. It was with some apprehension, therefore, that one of her sons drove to her house one morning in answer to her phone call. When he arrived, she said she suspected that there was a burglar in her bedroom closet since she had heard noises in there the night before. Well, why didn't you call me last night? He exclaimed. Well, she replied, it was late and I hated to bother you. So I just nailed the closet shut and went to bed. Now that's the kind of attitude a Christian can have when faced with the impossible. Nail the door of fear shut and go to bed in calm assurance. And now the question is, how do we get others to come to Jesus? One way is through relational discipleship. Now you may ask, what is he talking about now? Relational discipleship. Well, this is where you build a relationship with another person so that they can see what you stand for, and then they will listen to you. Relational discipleship is a process of being connected in relationships that equip us and encourage others to be more like Christ. You don't win their souls for Jesus. You simply share the message, the gospel, and the Holy Spirit is the one who wins souls for Jesus. So there they are, the four components of the discipleship process. My closing question to you is, in what component are you? Are you identifying what is in your heart? Are you acknowledging Jesus' decision and invitation to you? Are you accepting Jesus' invitation? Or are you accepting the call of a disciple of Jesus? Once you determine that, you can determine God's plan for you. Amen. This morning, we're going to do prayers of the people. And if you would share what's on your hearts and minds. Does anybody have any prayer requests or something to celebrate today? I'd like uh, prayers for my wife, Pat. She's going to have her knee replacement on Thursday. I'd like prayers for one of my neighbors, Al Smith. He's been going through a problem with cancer in his throat for two or three years now. And um, he went in last week, and uh, they're going to put in something, or they're going to take out the trach that he was talking through. And um, he has to heal up, and um, then he's going to be talking through, I guess, some sort of a microphone type thing. And uh, it's just been one thing after another for that poor guy. Um, it's been going on for two years, infections and what have you. But I'd like prayers for Alan very much. Thank you. Just a praise wrapped up as a prayer as well. Um, you know, Daisy's being Dairy Princess. It's a lot and it's very intense and she's in the public eye a lot because of it and me being her mother, I'm not always like practicing the grace that I should or the kind words. I don't always come with that 
calming heart. And as I sit in church and think about all the imperfections I have in it, I ask that you continue to pray for me as a mom, that I'm not quite as reactionary as I tend to lead with that strong-hearted foot first instead of that foot of <coughs> grace that this church and congregation is so good at reminding us all of. Um, it's, it's a blessing to have such a family to help raise her and get them through it. So, you know, thanks for helping me get her there, but pray that I be less mean in all <laughs> honesty. Um, prayers for Pastor Jim and Kathy as I would assume that you know this next week is going to be a, a big transition for them. They're trying to wrap up getting out of the mans and getting into their new home and seeing what new normal looks like for them. So just prayers as they continue to follow God's plan for them. Tuesday, I go to a presbytery meeting, and I uh, look for your prayers for that because <laughs> Reverend Jim said, "Oh, we're, they're going to roast me, and you're you're kind of in charge of that." And I'm still going through the uh, emails to figure out exactly what he meant by that. But I guess <laughs> I guess the best way to find out is Tuesday when I go. First of all, a praise that, uh, speaking for Tom, we are happy to be here and we're excited about what lies ahead. Um, and I feel comfortable enough to offer this. My uh, uncle, my, um, I guess it's my father's brother-in-law, Uncle Jerry, they've discovered an aneurysm on his heart. And he's 88 years old, he's under morphine, um, but pray for discernment with my Uncle Jerry and my cousin, his son, that they can decide, do we risk, the? because I guess the surgery to repair an aneurysm, a, a bulb on his heart wall is very serious. He's otherwise quite healthy, but pray for discernment and a decision that, uh, it, yeah, it's, it's very complicated and it's, these things are always inevitable, but you're never ready for them when it happens. So pray, pray for Jerry and Mike and Kathy as they decide what to do. Thank you for giving me the confidence in this great congregation to do this. And we, you've just seen a miracle, a great <laughs> sermon. Thank you. Great sermon. Yeah. I'm going to offer up one more, too. Uh, I have a colleague who just this past week, well, I found out this past week, I think she was diagnosed a little sooner. Um, she's just 50, but um, she has uh, been diagnosed with stage four colon cancer, and it's also moved to her stomach and lungs. So um, doesn't doesn't sound like a good report. So please join me in prayer at this time. Good morning, Lord. We value the time we are able to have with you this morning to look deeper into your word and to learn more about the discipleship process that you created and have directed us to continue. Lord, we are each at different places in our journey with you. We know we need to continue to build our relationship with you and with others so that your message and your plan can be followed through. Lord, we ask for you to continue to equip us with the tools we need to overcome our fears and spread your message as far as we can. We thank you for your constant support of us and all that you are to us and for us. Lord, today you've heard various prayer requests from the congregation and uh, Lord, we pray for Pat and uh, with her knee replacement surgery on Thursday. Uh, be with her surgeon and all those on that team 
and um, just let her feel your presence as, as she has that done. Lord, we pray for Al Smith and the procedure he's going to have done soon and the, the ordeal that he's been through in the past two years and just help him to continue to be a blessing to others and help him get through the pain and, and through this process as well. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings that come with Daisy being Dairy Princess and all that that entails. And we know that's tough on her, and we know sometimes that's tough on, on Mary also. So we pray that, that you will uh, bless Mary and, and uh, have her be that role model that Daisy needs to see and others as well, and just continue to be with them as this continues. Lord, we pray today for Pastor Jim and Kathy as they will be moving this week. Um, so many challenges with a new home and a new phase of life, but they know you are with them and guiding them every step of the way. Lord, we pray for Ed, who will be attending the Presbytery meeting, and just uh, put some calm in his heart that, that he can represent Valencia Presbyterian as well as anybody. Lord, we thank you that Jim and Tom are, are here with us this morning and will be with us in supporting and uh, supporting us along the way. Um, Lord, we pray for Jim's Uncle Jerry and just give the family discernment regarding the surgery. And if there is a, a procedure to take place, um, be with, with all those who will participate in that. And Lord, we pray for my colleague who uh, was recently diagnosed with the cancer and, and we do believe in miracles and if it is your will that, that she be healed, but we ask that you be with her family and support them throughout this ordeal. And now Lord, we pray to you the words that you gave us so long ago saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now we will have uh, recite together in unison the Nicene Creed. If you would stand for this, please. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the only begotten of the Father, before all worlds, God of God, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and became incarnate, by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, the Son, who is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through prophets. Amen. Please be seated. God has provided for all we need and more. Let us return these gifts to God so that we might provide for one another and all who are in need. Let us receive the morning offering either in person, here, by mail, or by using our website online. Please join me in prayer of dedication of all of our giving. Lord, we present these tokens of the many blessings you have poured into our lives. Make us people who are unafraid to proclaim your healing mercies. Help these gifts to bring hope and comfort to all those in need. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And now for our closing hymn, if you would stand with me and sing two verses of Lord, you give the Great Commission.
Now for our benediction. Get ready to go into God's world. Bring messages of hope to all. As we have been blessed, may we bring blessings to all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.